Hello and welcome back to my review and recap of the Fallout television series. And I'll offer my usual warning that I will be spoiling this episode and all previous and future episodes in the series. So watch out for that if you've not seen the programme before. But let us dive straight in. And we find ourselves staring into the face of Wilzig. This is the head of Wilzig, a renegade scientist who had his head chopped off. And not in the last episode, but the one before that, we saw Thaddeus and Maximus rescue this head from the stomach of a gulper. Anyhow, it turns out they're all sheltering in this underpass, and Thaddeus and Maximus are getting along very well indeed, recounting all their adventures. It seems they're becoming fast friends. And to sort of seal their friendship, Thaddeus suggests that he ought to be branded on the back of the neck, which is a tradition that the Brotherhood have developed. It all looks rather painful, and it does turn out to be extremely painful in Thaddeus' case. But since they are getting along quite well, Maximus decides this might be quite a good opportunity to spill the beans, so to speak, and tell Thaddeus that he's not, in fact, Knight Titus. And as you can imagine, Thaddeus is extremely shocked by this news, and warns Maximus that once the Brotherhood find out, they're going to kill him. Because the plan is now that Thaddeus and Maximus will return to the Brotherhood with the head. But it seems that Maximus thinks that he can keep his identity hidden. And all poor Thaddeus does is point out that this is going to be impossible. And once they do discover Maximus's identity, his head's on the chopping block. And what follows next is perhaps Maximus's lowest point in the whole series. In about 10 seconds, he turns from being quite friendly to Thaddeus to deciding to kill him. And he sort of lunges at Thaddeus saying, I should have known better than to trust you. The implication being that it's like Thaddeus has threatened to reveal Maximus's identity to the Brotherhood, and you know, nothing could be further from the truth. Nothing Thaddeus says suggests that. And in fact, you know, just offers the very good advice that the Brotherhood are going to be extremely displeased by this turn of events. Anyhow, Maximus starts stomping about trying to crush the life out of Thaddeus, and he steps on his foot, you know, mangling his foot. And Thaddeus has got the key to the power armour, or rather the key to the fusion core on the back of the power armour. And he manages to climb up on Maximus, take out the power core and render Maximus helpless. After which he gets his bag and the head and goes off up the railway tracks. And I really do think this whole scene could have been played a lot better. Having Maximus suddenly turn into this psychopath in like, I think literally 10 seconds, doesn't show him in a very good light at all. We had been quite sympathetic towards Maximus, but now he comes across as a complete maniac. And I think what they should have done is that, you know, Maximus and Thaddeus should have, you know, been talking about, you know, how they could keep the secret from the Brotherhood. And then for Thaddeus to get quite paranoid and suddenly accuse Maximus of wanting to kill him to keep his secret. And then Thaddeus could, you know, really freak out, could back away, could injure his foot somehow. Maximus goes forward to help him. Thaddeus freaks out even more and then disables the power armour and then runs off. And it would have made Thaddeus look a bit of an idiot. But Thaddeus is a bit flaky anyway, and it wouldn't have meant we had to have this weird about face of Maximus turning from nice guy to psycho. It was really quite an odd moment and something that could have been avoided quite easily, I think. Anyway, Maximus is left trapped in his suit and his final interactions with Thaddeus are alternately threatening to kill him and begging him for help. And I do quite like the irony of Maximus being helpless in the suit. I mean, the power armor should be there to protect him but now it looks like it's going to be his coffin. And to the sound of Maximus's plaintive cries, we suddenly cut to the Fallout logo. So now it's morning and Maximus is getting really sweaty and desperate inside his suit. And he hears these scrabbling sounds from outside and suddenly realizes that there's this gang of rad roaches crawling all over him. And he really starts to panic. Although I'm not sure what rad roaches could do to a suit of power armor. I'm assuming Maximus is scared because they could presumably gnaw their way through the soft bits around the joints. But Maximus doesn't have to worry too much since someone with a gun comes along and starts blasting them. And that someone turns out to be Lucy. Yeah, Lucy has somehow stumbled across Maximus. I'll talk a little bit more about that in a minute. She blasts the rad roaches and then spends quite a lot of time stomping on them. But once that's done, Lucy manages to get the faceplate off the power armor 
and Maximus is, as you'd expect, you know, begging to be let out of the suit. But Lucy, somewhat oddly, doesn't trust him. She says that ever since she came out of the vault, nearly everyone has tried to kill her, which is true. But at the same time, Maximus has saved her life. Yet on two occasions, you know, he pushed her out of the way of some bullets and then shielded her from the ghoul while he tried to pump like half a dozen shots into her. So if I was in Lucy's shoes, I feel I would be a lot happier to see Maximus than anyone else in the wasteland and I would not treat him like an enemy. So her behaviour doesn't strike me as being terribly consistent with their past history. Anyhow, Lucy starts throwing up and Maximus recognises this as a symptom of radiation sickness and says that he's got some rad away in his suit and that if she lets him out, she can have the rad away, which she agrees to. And it's just in the nick of time because as soon as Maximus steps out of the suit, Lucy collapses in a dead faint. Now at this point, I should say how unlikely it is that Lucy has actually stumbled across Maximus because she's tracking the head that's been carried off by Thaddeus and Maximus has been stuck in the suit all night and it seems for most of the morning. So Thaddeus must be miles away and Maximus would have to be somewhere on a straight line between Lucy and Thaddeus if Lucy had any chance of stumbling across him at all, which is possible, I admit, but highly unlikely. I think a better way of doing this would be to have something that attracted Lucy's attention to Maximus's location. So for example, the rad roaches attack him Two of them start fighting on his head or something. One falls off, knocks a, a can of oil into the fire perhaps. That blows up. The power armour is covered in burning rubbish and it looks like Maximus is going to get fried. And we cut away to Lucy, who's some distance away. She hears the noise of the explosion, looks over, sees the smoke. And then we cut back to Maximus with Lucy appearing to save the day. I mean, you know, that is quite weak, perhaps, but we do need a better reason for Lucy to find Maximus than pure luck, because it is highly unlikely, and the way they've done it in the show is not really very believable at all. Anyhow, we leave Maximus and Lucy behind, and we are back in the vaults, and this is Vault 32, with Norm, who's Lucy's brother, and Chet. And we saw them in the last episode, exploring Vault 32, and realising that everyone who was dead in the vault had been dead for years and that they couldn't have been killed by the raiders, which, you know, everyone had assumed had overrun the vault quite recently. So our dynamic duo are still exploring, looking for clues, and they keep coming across these horrible tableaus showing the inhabitants of Vault 32 have been trying to kill each other. And they come across the internal door to Vault 31. And it seems that the inhabitants of Vault 32 have been trying to break into Vault 31 using cutting torches and big hammers. And on the wall, someone has written, we know what's in there, which is quite unlikely because everyone does know what's in there, it seems. So why bother writing it on the wall? Who exactly is this message for? But this rather alarming discovery is enough to send Norm and Chet packing and they run back through the tunnel to Vault 33 where they happen to run into Betty, one of the triumvirate that happens to be running Vault 33 in the absence of an overseer. And to explain their rather dishevelled appearances, they come up with a rather lame excuse that they've been out planting Tato's. And from the look on Betty's face, we get the impression that she's not entirely convinced by this story. Anyhow, back to the underpass and Lucy is taking a dose of Radaway and we find that Maximus has gone to the trouble of dragging the power armour down onto these tracks and he's now covering it with all sorts of rubble, which is quite a sensible precaution, but does also seem to be quite a lot of effort. Yeah, in his shoes, I think I'll have tried to find a bit of tarpaulin and just chuck it over the top. But Maximus is being particularly thorough here. And while Maximus is working, he and Lucy are having quite a nice conversation and she mentions that she's a vault dweller and Maximus says something that's a little bit strange. He says that he thought that monsters lived in vaults and you would think that he knew that humans lived in vaults but perhaps someone told him that vault dwellers were monsters in a sort of metaphorical sense or it could be a reference to the fact that some of the vaults are actually breeding monsters which we find out in a later episode. But Maximus is explaining to Lucy that his squire has stolen something important to the Brotherhood and he has to go off and find it. And Lucy responds by saying that she's got a tracker in the head and that they can find it together. And this is quite weird because she has no idea that Maximus is looking for a head. 
And she sort of claws this back a little bit by saying that everyone in the world is looking for this head. So she just assumes that Maximus is looking for it too. But really, the only other person that she knows of who's looking for a head is the ghoul. So it all sounds quite weak. It's just so very strange for her to assume that Maximus is looking for a head. I mean, a better way of introducing this would have been for Maximus to ask Lucy if she'd seen someone carrying a head. Lucy does appear to have come from the direction that Thaddeus was heading off to. So it would be very natural for Maximus to ask Lucy if she'd caught sight of him. And then Lucy can say, you know, oh, I'm looking for that head too. We can go together. Anyhow, Maximus is just about to set out by himself when Lucy says, well, you know, let's make a deal. I'll help you find the head with my tracker. Once we find the head, you can lend me some Brotherhood types and we'll go and find this raider and rescue my father. And that sounds a good deal to Maximus, so they shake on it and off they go. Back in Vault 33 and we hear a Tannoy announcement about the upcoming election and it seems that each member of the Triumvirate, who are currently ruling the Vault, are now contenders for the post of Overseer. And it is now voting day and we see everyone queuing up. And the line here includes Reg, who's one of the Triumvirate, and he's chatting with Davy, this tall blonde guy. And Davy is quite apologetic because he's confessing to Reg that he's voting for Betty. And Reg seems to come to the realisation that Betty's overwhelming popularity means that he and Woody don't really stand a chance at all. And in fact, when he gets to the voting booth, he doesn't even vote for himself. He votes for Betty too. Back in the wasteland, and Maximus and Lucy are walking the railway tracks as they follow the head. And they can do this because while the head was in Lucy's possession, she stuffed a tracking device up its nose. And they're chatting away as Lucy reminisces about her life in the vault. And in particular, she remembers her mother, who used to take her out into the cornfields. And we see a flashback of this. And based on things we see later in the series, it's possible that Lucy is conflating memories of her life in the vault with memories of her life outside the vault with her mother. Because we later discover that Lucy's mother kidnapped Lucy and her brother from the vault and took them outside for a little while. So Lucy says that when she was little, she was convinced that the light in the vault was the sun. But in fact, she might actually be remembering the real sun when she was a little girl. And in return, Maximus tells Lucy about the most important part of his childhood, which was having a nuclear bomb go off in his backyard. And Lucy's a bit sceptical about this. She knows all about the nuclear war that created the wasteland, but she's not aware of any more recent explosions. So when Maximus tells her that a bomb went off and destroyed his home, she doesn't really believe him at this point. Back in the vault and Reg is looking at the computer records. In particular, he's looking at the records of all the personnel who have transferred between the vaults. And he makes the rather surprising discovery that all the overseers of Vault 32 originally came from Vault 31. And the same was true of Vault 32. All their overseers came from Vault 31 as well. And it is a very surprising coincidence. But at the same time, you ask yourself why no one spotted this before. The fact that for the last 200 years, every overseer they've ever had has been from Vault 31 is something you'd think someone else would have noticed. And while Norm is looking at the records, we cut between him and the main hall where Betty is enjoying a slice of victory cake because it turns out that she's won the election with I think about 98% of the vote. And Norm manages to tear himself away from the computer to come and offer his congratulations. And based on the look on Betty's face, we gather she's quite suspicious of Norm and what he's been up to. Out in the wasteland once more, and the railway tracks have led Maximus and Lucy to this bridge. Unfortunately, they're not alone, and they see these two rather suspicious figures on the other side. And these two strangers say they're unarmed and want to cross the bridge with no trouble. And Lucy, weirdly, is quite trusting of these people. So Lucy's attitude has flipped again. She was very distrustful of Maximus when she saw him. But now it seems that she's quite content to trust these two strangers. And it's a shame that Lucy's character keeps flip-flopping like this. She's quite inconsistent. She'll be very trusting one minute and very suspicious the next. It just depends on what the plot needs her to be at the time. Anyway, Maximus wants to take Lucy's gun but Lucy refuses and instead comes up with a compromise in that both groups will cross the bridge at the same time, but they'll do it with our hands up. And this is something our two mysterious strangers agree to. 
and we get this quite funny scene where everyone's shuffling towards each other with their hands in the air. And this plan goes quite well until one of the strangers spots Lucy's Pip-Boy and it seems that this is enough to convince her that Lucy is worth robbing and she immediately pulls out a gun and starts blasting away. But Maximus is equally quick off the mark. He grabs Lucy's gun and quickly blasts the other two while getting wounded in the arm. But he says that it's only a scratch more or less and that Lucy shouldn't worry about it. Back in the vault and Woody is mulling over one of his posters and we discover that it's one of the 10 posters that he put up for his election campaign. And we see Davy again offering his commiserations and he tells Woody that he shouldn't feel too bad and that he should remember the old saying that when things look glum, you should vote for someone from Vault 31. Which is fair enough, I suppose, but if every overseer you've ever had is from Vault 31, then, you know, are things always glum? It seems you vote for 31 no matter what. And now we cut away to Chet's apartment. And Chet is looking after Stephanie's baby. Stephanie being another vault dweller who lost her eye and a husband in the raider attack. And Norm is describing to Chet how all their overseers have been from Vault 31 and this is an unbroken pattern for the last 200 years and that the same has happened in Vault 32. And Chet really doesn't want to think about it. He's got enough on his plate as it is, I think. And he's quite content to put it down to a weird coincidence. But it's at this point we discover that Stephanie, who's now living with Chet, is also from Vault 31. And it seems that this is another reason why Chet is quite reluctant to discuss the topic. And speak of the devil, it's now that Stephanie makes her appearance and Norm asks her about her life in Vault 31 and how it might differ from life in Vault 33. And Stephanie makes the rather offhand remark that perhaps the mashed potatoes were better in Vault 31. Anyhow, this comment segues rather nicely to the next scene where we see some mashed potato on a tray being pushed by Norm. Yeah, Norm's job is now serving food to the prisoners and it's while he's pushing this tray along that we hear an announcement from Betty to say that she's been considering the future of Vault 32. And her plan is that Vault 32 ought to be repopulated by the inhabitants of Vault 33. But more on that later as we're back in the wasteland with Maximus and Lucy. And they come across the sign to Shady Sands, which is the first capital of the New California Republic. And this is quite a shock to Lucy because this is a tangible sign of a civilization that grew up after the bombs fell. And Lucy had always been under the impression that it was the vault dwellers who would sort of rise up and bring civilization back to the wasteland. But it seems the people on the surface managed to do it all by themselves. So this leads Lucy to doubt the whole purpose of the vaults and, you know, everything she's grown up with. Yeah, she makes the remark, Reclamation Day happened without us. Anyhow, they walk a little further on and come across the huge crater, which is the remains of Shady Sands. And Lucy asks Maximus what happened. And Maximus delivers a line that became quite well known through the trailers, saying everyone just wants to save the world. They just disagree on how. And in the same way that Lucy had a flashback to her childhood, we now see Maximus do something similar. And this is a repeat of footage we've seen quite a few times of the young Maximus climbing out of a fridge and then being rescued by the Brotherhood. So quite a poignant scene, but it's at this point that Lucy realises that Maximus is more badly injured than he thought and she pulls out this bandage stuffed down his sleeve and it's absolutely soaked in blood. So she insists they go and find some help. Though I feel I should point out that no one seems bothered by the possibility of radiation. You would think that them standing by the crater of a nuclear explosion would make them a little bit cautious and you might also expect the Geiger counter in Lucy's Pip-Boy to be going off, but apparently not. And just like Lucy's trust levels, the radiation levels in the Fallout TV show seem to vary depending on what the plot needs them to be. So sometimes radiation very serious, sometimes it's ignored completely. But given the seriousness of Maximus's injury, he and Lucy tramp off through the town looking for some help and they soon come across a large building called the Hawthorne Medical Laboratories, which looks extremely promising as far as medical supplies goes. And if you look in the background in this shot, you'll see a large building on the horizon. And that turns out to be the entrance to Vault 4. And we'll become more familiar with Vault 4 in the next episode. But just bear in mind that the entrance to Vault 4 is quite a long way out of town. Anyway, Lucy is very anxious to get inside, whereas Maximus is much more cautious. 
But Lucy kind of vanishes and Maximus has to go in and find her. And he comes to this dimly lit corridor where amazingly the lights are still on and this leads him towards this doorway. But it seems that Lucy was right and there are medical supplies inside. But when Maximus enters this room, he discovers that the doorway on the other side is a dummy. Then the room fills with gas and he sort of vanishes into the floor. So he was right to be suspicious and this building is in fact a trap. Back in Vault 33 and Betty is leading a party into Vault 32. As she mentions in the Tannoy announcement, she's determined that Vault 32 should be repopulated. So she's bringing a party of Vault Dwellers in to have a look and see where some of them might be living quite soon. And of course it was only a few days since Norm and Chet were here and the place was an absolute disaster, full of death and destruction and two-year-old corpses. And while the fields are still full of dead crops, we discover that Vault 32 has been cleaned up and it looks absolutely pristine. And we get some quite nice shots contrasting how it looks now with how it looked when Norm and Chet were wandering around. And when I saw all this, I assumed that people from Vault 31 had come along and tidied up the vault, because someone had to tidy up the vault. But we'd later discover that Vault 31 is basically full of people in cryogenic suspension. But I suppose it's possible that they woke some of those people up and got them to do the work. But it's also possible that Vault 31 has a huge fleet of Mr. Handy robots. Anyway, Norm leaves the group and goes to the overseer's office which had been formerly occupied by the corpse of the previous overseer and he finds that the overseer's computer has been destroyed and it's while Norm is looking around that Betty sort of creeps up behind him and asks him if he's found anything interesting and of course she could be referring to his look around now but we get the impression that she's really inquiring about his previous visit. It's now becoming very obvious that Betty appears to know that Norm had been looking around Vault 32 when it was still a wreck and Norm, rather foolishly, appears to confirm this suspicion by saying good job cleaning up. Yes, in his shoes I'd be playing dumb. Betty doesn't look like someone to trifle with. She's turning into quite a sinister character. So leaving Norm alone with his thoughts, we go back to Lucy and Maximus. And we find them on stretchers in this rather curious little room that's got a sign on the wall saying caution, falling objects. And this suggests that this room is directly below the trap and that they fell down unconscious and that someone has laid them out on these stretchers. But Lucy's the first on her feet and she finds a window and makes for her a very happy discovery. She tells Maximus that everything's going to be okay because they're in the best place in the world. They are in a vault and it's there that we leave them. Lucy looking very pleased to be back in a place that's somewhat approaching home and Maximus with the usual stunned expression on his face. But yeah, overall, I think a very enjoyable episode. I mean, lots wrong with it, as I've pointed out. But it's all quite entertaining at the same time. And it's always good to see Lucy again. Unfortunately, the next episode gets rather silly. It's somewhat of a disappointment. Anyhow, I hope you enjoyed this episode. I hope to see you for the next one. And until I do see you again, I shall say goodnight. Okay then, cheerio. Yeah.